Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Let's just roll. We want to we want to know about you and your journey because uh, Michael and I were talking off air. You got a really interesting journey. How the uh-huh. hell did you end up there? I mean, you became fluent in Thai and everything. Pro gamer, mixed nationality, family. Where do we start? What do we need to know? Yeah, where do we go? We want to get well, deep into this story. I think the most important thing about me and really the biggest lesson in entrepreneurship I could potentially teach anyone really is play a lot of video games in high school. <laughs> so why though? I'm not arguing. Yeah. I'm just so, curious. I mean, I'm being a bit facetious here, but uh, I was a huge gamer in high school. I was playing about six hours a day of, I think, EverQuest it was back then. Oh, wow. And... Um, you know, with everything that comes with it, you know, like, you know, parents being annoyed at that, uh, skipping classes and, uh, you know, the whole the whole deal. So um, I was a professional gamer before I was a professional gamer. And right. um, so I just enough. spent all this time playing video games. And one day I ran into someone in that game and found out that actually there's people who do this for money. Right. So um, I said, well, I could do that. So I, I ran into a guy who basically told me, he was playing the game and selling the money he was making the game to other players. That was, was that well, it's kind of a virtual world. EverQuest back then was kind of, well, nowadays people would probably know more, something like World of Warcraft. Yep. So you live yep. in this virtual world. And um, in this virtual world, you have interactions with other people. You buy items from them. You do quests. You do tasks. And since people spend so much time in these virtual worlds, the actual assets they have in those worlds kind of have a real value. What do you mean, like like selling a magical sword to somebody or stuff like that? Is that what you're talking about? I mean, yeah. The the thing is, like, if you spend, if you play six hours of that game every day, you probably wear your virtual armor more than you know. For some players, (laughs) the actual pants, (laughs) the regular clothes. (laughs) Okay. So um, obviously that has value and other people admire it for you. You know, if you have an achievement in that game, there will be other people who walk up to you and say, wow, how did you do that? And all this kind of this social proof and this virtual world and the immersion makes people assign value to these items. And um, being someone who's played those games a lot, I just figured out, okay, I'm actually pretty good at that. I can get items for other people and um, sell it to them. And that's how I got started with that. And uh, I think at some point I was literally playing the game and uh, getting about $2,000 a month for just playing the game. Um, so can I, can I unpack this for a second? This is actually interesting. So what sure. you're saying is you're existing in this virtual world and we can make the equivalency to just like having a, having a job in the regular world where let's say you're a coal miner and everybody needs coal. And you see, so you go out and you get these, you finish these quests, you get these virtual goods that other people may want, but don't know how to get them because they're not as skilled as you are at the game. And then they come to you in this virtual world. Again, you have social proof because maybe you've already sold stuff or traded things with other people inside the game. And they say, hey, Karsten, I want to have that thing, whatever that thing is. And you go, sure. And it has a value because there's an actively or at least relatively actively traded market in it inside the game. And they say, I'll give you 50 bucks for that. And you say, mm, how about 52? And they're like, done. And they buy that good from you. And there's a way inside the game mechanism to transfer the ownership of that to somebody else? In essence, yes. The only difference being that we probably used something more traditional for the actual advertising of products and services. And back then, that was eBay. So if you went to uh-huh. eBay, you could see hundreds or thousands of auctions or buy now uh, items for literally, you could you could shop on eBay for items in a video game. Mm. Wow. So, I mean, that was the early phase of that market, right? Where people, um, I think I knew a guy in Ohio, he was making $50,000 a month playing that game. I mean, he was very, very good. So, um, What, what, what sort was, of things were commanding money? What were people paying money? Give, give us an example for the listeners. You know, I made 100 bucks doing this or 1000 bucks doing that. What, what was, where was the money in that game? I think the best way to go about it in the game was to provide the most liquid form of asset, and that is money. So selling virtual money uh-huh. was always the <laughs> net of the highest yield. Um, right. And um, the, if you're talking about items, usually the items that you couldn't get on your own 
output that you needed a whole group for. Like some of the tasks in those games were so difficult that you needed a whole group of people to get them who then split that loot between them. So if you are, let's say, a, a lawyer in New York and you play a game maybe an hour or two at night, you don't have that in-game social friends network hmm. to go on these tasks that get you these high-value items. So why waste so much time playing that game to get to the point when you can just pay someone $200 and get it? So, um, And, of course, for the people who are already in the game, for them it's a pretty easy task to just add that on. So it works out for everyone. Wow, that's incredible! That's an incredible mechanism, and, that, and somehow you own it in under your persona or your avatar in the game, and you just give it away to somebody else. Pretty much. I mean, in the game, you can trade items, you can hand things over. So um, that was pretty much the start of this whole, um, well, real money trading. I think actually um, Neil Stevenson wrote that into one of his books later on. Um, basing an entire novel around that concept of gold farming, as it was used to be called. Right. I think nowadays, you know, a lot of companies have caught on to that, that you can actually make more money from, you know, making people care about the game than selling them the game, which is why you have all these app freemium games that, you know, let you get the game for free, but then you pay, you know, hundreds, sometimes thousands of dollars for all the items that you've grown emotionally attached to and that is kind of a better business model and i think that's one of the reasons that you see behind this whole game industry changing from teenagers in their parents basement to the parents upstairs now playing all these games on the phone because they have an easy way in and if you look at these games nowadays they really uh, know how to push your buttons and you know open your wallet and I think that's really a bit of a lesson they learned from just observing what happened in these games. So what, what's your view on things like esports and the whole emergence of, you know, actually training teams, running leagues and, you know, gigantic multi-million dollar prizes for playing video games, yeah? I think to a degree that always existed. I remember back in the 20 years ago, I think one of the first professional game players was Thresh. He was playing Quake back then. He was winning Ferraris at uh, game competitions. And I always felt that this focus on prices, it enables a lot more people to do this full time. And especially in countries like South Korea, where, it's, where you have television stations broadcasting right. and We've been doing that for years. I think that's really a big trend. I think, however, I mean, it's not, it's not the big money maker yet. Um, I think right now the best model in games is still to kind of create the digital equivalent of a pellet dispenser and monetize it how casinos do. Um, I think that's, um, it's not as much focused yet. Maybe if someone figures out in the future how to draw in how to not only get everybody to play games, but also everybody to watch games, that might change. Because right. already now you have already everybody playing games. Like if you go on the subway in Bangkok, you will see everybody on their phone. And I would say it's maybe a 50-50 split between people who are on Facebook and people who are playing some kind of freemium game. And if you get those people to stop, you know, watching or reading Facebook and actually watch other people play games, then I think you got it figured out. I haven't seen anybody do that, but... That well, Twitch, is, Twitch is a gigantic gaming network, right, that was sold to Amazon a couple of years ago for a billion dollars. That's happening. And I just saw recently a company in Singapore, Spout Entertainment. So Spout also does e-gaming and e-sports, and they're building an entire network around that as well. So it's kind of nascent... In Southeast Asia, but in China, you have $25 million prizes being given away for teams that are organized around games, right? And most mm -hmm. of those games are shooter games, you know, where people, and also quest games as well, right? So the type of stuff that you were doing when you were younger. And so you said you also were working with the Thai government? Yeah, so... How did, how did that happen? <laughs> we, we started our company pretty much right out of university in Germany. And about a year in, we noticed, okay, Germany might not be the best place if 
none of your customers are actually in Germany. I mean, yeah. back then, all the people who played those games were in the U.S., um, in English-speaking countries. Germany back then was still a bit of a digital backwater. And um, we looked around, okay, what are the other options? And my business partner at the time had done an internship in Thailand during business school. So we figured, well, maybe there is something about Thailand. Obviously, we heard about it as, you know, kind of a cheap labor market thing, but that was all we knew. So we called up the Thai embassy and asked them, well, like, okay, hey, we want to start a company in Thailand. And um, how do we do that? And their reaction was, they just laughed at us. They're like, okay, yeah, very funny. Uh, we need another beer bar at the beach. Absolutely. Right. Uh, but, uh, how about, here's the thing. How about you talk to the board of investment? That BOI. is the, That's the BOI. Yes, yes, the BOI. That's the investment promotion agency of the Thai government. They have uh, representative offices all over the world. Uh, one of them being in Frankfurt, which was literally like, five kilometers away from our home. So we figured, okay, let's go there. And we talked to them and we explained to them our project we had in mind. They said, yep, that's something we would like to promote. And they helped us basically create, um, fill out a form and fill out the, you know, put together a business plan that we submitted to um, the Thai government. And they approved it within, I think, uh, we had an interview within two weeks and they approved it within a month. Um, so that the BOI, this board of investment, is the uh, department of the Thai government that they use to attract strategic investment to the country. In right. the past, that used to be like big investments, automotive plans, scientific research. But in the last 10, 20 years, it's shifted over to software companies, technology companies. And um, it's now at a point, I had a recently a, a blog reader of mine who literally walked into the BOI office in uh, in Bangkok, said, I, I sent you emails. You didn't reply. I want to apply for this promotion. They're like, okay, let's sit down and fill out the form. And they sat down with him for five hours, filled out the form for his uh, um, software company. And within, you know, he filled it out within five hours and they approved him. Mm -hmm. As in, he literally walked into the... <laughs> office in bangkok and just sat down i want to fill out the form and like okay wow and would that happen in germany <laughs> uh, i guess the, the you would have had you would, if you add enough zeros yes i would assume so but um in thailand i think that what they're asking for nowadays is you need to have a payroll of fifty thousand dollars per year um to get uh to pass that limit and that's basically, um, you know, even at high salaries, that is um, two, three, four guys or your own salary. Um, so it's very easy to get this investment promotion, which is different. All these promotions uh, exist in other Southeast Asian and other countries all over the world. But I think Thailand has one of the lowest uh, thresholds in tech that allow you to set up a shop here. Um, it comes with, uh, I think right now they lowered it. It might be only five years of tax holidays. Yep, used to be eight. eight. Used to be eight, I think. I think it's, uh, yeah. So, uh, and plus, uh, what's also exceptional in Thailand, you get to own it 100% yourself, which usually you can't because Thailand has rules and laws that you uh, can only be a minority shareholder. In practice, people find ways around that, but this way you can actually legally, on paper, own your own company here 100%. Another issue a lot of companies here have is work permits for foreigners. Right. So Thailand is very restrictive about work permits. And having this investment promotion kind of eliminates 80% of the limitations. So it, which means you can pretty freely hire foreigners for positions in Thailand. And since Thailand is a really desirable location for a lot of people in tech, it makes it very easy to recruit staff. So if you have an investment promotion in Thailand and you can offer um, tech people from all over the world to come here and work here legally, you can probably recruit talent at a rate much lower to what you would be paying elsewhere, not only because you know Thai programmers are cheaper, but because foreigners are willing to come to Thailand to work for less just because they get to live here. But also the cost of living is less. In other words, if you're making $100,000 and living in Silicon Valley or making $50,000 and living in Bangkok, it's essentially the same amount of money, if not more. I would probably and say it's more, yes. <laughs> it's more, yeah. And to the extent that you get to work on projects that are global, 
right? There are plenty of development houses. It's a great point you make, actually. There are plenty of development houses in Bangkok. Um, Ozo is one of them, and there are others as well that just they they hire foreign programmers to go out and do global work where most of their clients are not resident and not domiciled in Thailand, but the programmers are. And part of the arbitrage there is the ability to hire great programmers and give international standard service to foreign development shops that that want uh, software developed at global standards. So you make a really great point, actually. Mm -hmm. I think there's actually now companies that focus on that specific advantage. Um, Have you heard of Igloo? Yeah, Yeah, Igloo's great. Yeah, so, I mean, that's what they're doing, right? They're literally just allowing foreign companies to send their existing staff here and put them on a payroll here, and everybody's happy. The company pays less. The guy gets to or girl gets to uh, live in Thailand, and it just leverages the benefits of the location more so than a lot of other companies. Right, and if you talk to Ozzy about the Igloo business model, right, so they've got an office in Chiang Mai, which is where that business started. Um, they now have an office in Bangkok and probably another one coming soon, and I believe they're probably opening one up in Phuket too. So again, you make a really good point, and your knowledge of Thailand is obviously more than most other people, particularly people that aren't here. But the ability to get people into the country using the board of investment um, you know, legal structure is actually really powerful when it comes to hiring world-class software developers, right? Absolutely. I think when we advertise a position for a system administrator in our you know, tiny company, I think the guy who was behind the Kubuntu distribution and who did the Ubuntu installation CD of what is it? Was it 2.12.04? He actually applied as a sysadmin at our company. Hmm. And uh, I'm like, why wow. would you do that? <laughs> why would you? Why would, like, I, I think you're like, <laughs> there's no way you could be more over. Where was he coming from? He wasn't in Thailand at the time. Uh, he wasn't. No, he was basically looking for, you know, um, he wanted to have a, a gig in Thailand that allowed him to stay here full time, work here legally and uh, just, you know, at, at the same time, of course, handle his passion projects. But I think that just illustrates on how, I mean, Thailand can offer something Silicon Valley can't. Like, it Beaches. can't. Like, you can, you, can, you, can, you can make up, well, you know, you have the fruits. And um, the point is, it has a very unique draw. And as a company who's based here, you have that draw as well. And you might not always be com- able to compete on the money, but you also don't always have to or not as much. Mm. So I think that's really also a reason why you see a lot of companies who are maybe – formally incorporated in Singapore to raise money, which is a lot easier there than in Thailand, um, also set up the operational base in Thailand because it's, especially if we're talking about people, you know, in their 20s or so without families, it's much easier to recruit them in Thailand than in many of the other places in the region. So how do you take advantage of that? I mean, you do a lot of sp- speaking as well. But how do you take advantage of that? In other words, what are your companies doing right now and where do you see the biggest expansion for you, just based on what you know and what you've done? I think for me personally, it's gotten to a point where I, I've been into games for so long, I kind of moved on from that. So um, the market has moved in games. And for me personally, that's like a, was an opportunity to say, okay, what is something new I can expand to? And I actually ended up trying out a few different things. And the one part I really settled on and that I'm currently building up is a resource website for people looking to move to Thailand, more looking to set up a company in Thailand, hiring or even just retiring to Thailand. Because I feel there's a lack of information for people in that space. So that's kind of my current personal passion project. That's Thailand um, Starter Kit, right? Give it a shout that's out. That's Thailand so people- Starter Kit. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, I mean, that, that basically just tells you how to, you know, find staff, how to set up insurance, you know, rent, the, the kind of pragmatic things, the stuff you don't see on a travel blog, just the stuff for which you read contracts. I think on a broader space, if you're looking at Thailand, what's happening there, just living here and seeing what other people are doing, and I assume a lot of listeners will care about what's happening in startups in Thailand, and um, that's interesting. Um, on one hand, you see there's a lot of additional interest. So recently, I was um, invited to judge a business contest 
uh, business idea contest. And the special thing about it was it was actually a Thai high school having that business contest at a Thai uh, at a university in Bangkok, inviting university staff and people from uh, the private sector to judge those high school plans. And I think like, okay, what high schoolers? What are they going to come up with? But it was really polished. I mean, those weren't actual businesses, but it was really, really polished. And um, I think it's really interesting to see even at that level already that uh, people getting more of an idea of uh, startups and business, whereas in the past, maybe a lot of career focus was more on, okay, get a nice gig with a big corporate or go into government, which is also very big here. So I think um, at an early stage where startups well, are made sexy or doing your own startups are made sexy. I think you see a change there. On the other hand, um, there is also a lot of heat in the market. If you look, for example, at something like uh, Happy Fresh and Honest Bee. Mm -hmm. So those are two grocery delivery services, um, which you have all over the world now. And um, I think Happy Fresh uh, was here first and Honest Bee joined later. And those are apps that let you order from supermarkets so you get your vegetables and your milk and and the amount of money i see them burning just trying to take market share from each other i'm wondering if that will ever be result in a positive roi because i personally assume those wouldn't result in very loyal customers because you can always just go to the next app and there's not much of a lock-in or barrier of entry so um, we've talked think... about Happy Fresh many a time here on ATP, right? And I think they sort of come in the end section. That's a big surprise when Michael sort of turns out. Well, I told you so. When it comes to talking <laughs> about startups, right? I mean, they are not the only ones. You also have Uber versus Grab, right? Exactly. And if if you look at, for example, Bangkok, I think I'm not sure. How, I know I noticed in Chiang Mai. I was recently in Chiang Mai. I noticed Uber and Grab are kind of even up, but in Bangkok, I think. Grab pretty much has it. Um, like that uh, ride sharing app is dominating to the point where you look at the Google Maps where you see the ads for the prices for, you know, how much does it take with an Uber? How much does it take with a Grab? A Grab is always half and usually within, you know, half the time from your uh, location. So I think, especially in Bangkok, it looks like Grab has won out over Uber, which I think is pretty impressive. Um, I don't have the inside data on them, but. Just as a customer, I noticed that. So I think you see a lot of um, global players coming into Thailand uh, who have succeeded elsewhere and battling it out over the Thai market. Um, I I'm not always sure how much that is driven by trying to make the overall numbers good and how much they really believe that they're going to do a positive ROI on the Thai market. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of things happening since I would say the last five years when Lazada, like Rocket Internet's startup back then in Thailand to imitate the Amazon model, came in and um, started really building up. And uh, since then, you've seen a lot of movement here. And uh, I think you what, had. Uh, hmm? What's your What's your view? Do you invest in these companies? Do you give speeches to these companies? Like, what's your participation in the startup world in Thailand? Um, I'm a member of Bansea, um, which is an angel network uh, based in Singapore, though, to be honest, I'm not a super active investor. So I follow this very closely. I talk to some companies. I uh, rarely end up giving money. But the point is, um, it's in a lot of cases, I just don't see the unit economics in the Thai market. However, to be really honest about that, I don't feel I have the necessary insight there to make a judgment call. Um, it will, I guess it remains to be seen. Yeah, I mean, so I do a lot of work there. I was just curious. You've been here probably as long, if not a little bit longer than I have, and run your own business as well. So I was just curious what your feeling on there is. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're running a single country business, right, like Wong Nai does that, right? And right. no, if you talk to the founder of Wong Nai, he'll say, and smart guy, right? Super smart guy, very well educated, really well connected, and you know, trying to do all the right things, particularly in the startup space. But he'll say he has no interest in expanding outside of Thailand. And frankly, in the last year, just expanded out of Bangkok. So I kind of agree with you in that respect that the unit economics for a company like that are going to be hard to expand, even though 
he has taken external investment, um, particularly from some Japanese investors that have put some decent amount of money into that business. So time will tell, right? And it is a three to five year out question as to whether that going to work but it's not just him right it's not just the one guy business the real mm-hmm. question is can you expand regionally or even globally if you come up with a good idea in <clears throat> in thailand yeah and I, I think i mean wong is a great example for that um I think so. I, because the, the big barrier of entry there of course is wong nai is thai language only right only. and um but what is really nice about wong nai it's kind of like trip advisor but it goes down to a dish specific level And uh, I think that I have that a lot when I go out eating, that, you know, you have to know which di- specific dish to order at a restaurant. And TripAdvisor won't tell you that, which is, no, I guess... It's not set up that, for that. And that reminds me of, like, Craigslist, where, you know, uh, Craigslist used to be across all categories. And then you had startups that started to get a really good solution for that individual category. Like, right. Craigslist had wanted ads, and now you have, you know, for apartments, now you have Airbnb. And in a way, the same thing is happening with TripAdvisor, where you have the big everything solution in travel, and then you have all these um, uh, individual startups that focus on one specific section of that, like Wong Nai, that's food-specific food. ones. Right. And that's actually so good. I mean, if Wong Nai would exist in another language, in another region, I would, like, just from the product perspective, I think it would be superior to all the other solutions I'm aware of right now. Um, but of course, it's more than just having, you know, the better product. Right. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that business develops. Like I said, right now, it's very domestic. So I'm curious how, how, that, um, how that happens. Do you do software development as well? Um, we still have some, but nowadays it's only maintenance. Ah, really? Really? Yeah, but personally, I basically switched to um, focusing very much on editorial, which is more of a personal preference really than anything else. So um, just from – used to be way more in software, and it's just been a personal journey because when I originally got into that, I was into games, and games right. was what I was breathing. And um, at some point, I felt, okay, this is – I'm now 35 And <laughs> I'm probably quite a bit removed from that person who originally got into that industry. And I just don't care about games anymore. Interesting. That's, yeah. So that's it's kind of, that's really what it comes down to. And I'm sure there could be a way I could, you know, re- reinvent myself and reinvent my company in games. But personally, I found it's, I prefer to move on to something else I care about. And right now, it's for me that is really helping people figure out Thailand, and um, that where I just see okay, this actually makes a difference in people's lives. So for me, that personal side was okay. If I'm in games, uh, you know, I, people enjoy themselves a little bit more, which is nice, but it doesn't give me as much fulfillment as you know someone who's faced with a you know. A big issue in Thailand, whether it's they have a legal problem, they have a medical emergency, or they have a they got cheated in some other context, or they just don't can't figure out how to read a contract or deal with a specific provider. And I feel like that makes more of a important difference in people's lives. And that's just my personal motivation to do that. And um, maybe it's a bit of a luxury problem to have that you can set your priorities to work on the things you feel stronger about. Um, so I don't see that as an industry trend. That's just me personally. Yeah, I mean, it feels like the modern way to work, right? You find something that you really love to do and you find a way to make it your living and then you just kind of run with it. I think as long as the numbers are okay, that's a good way to go about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as long as it's feeding you and giving you a place to live, I'm not sure there's much more to ask for. Although I don't, I don't know everybody's preferences, but... Carson, just sort of, I mean, looking at your journey, just I want to, I know you're talking about moving on from games and now you're sort of doing the Thailand Starter Kit stuff, which is more meaningful for you. But I I kind of, we kind of missed a bit and I just want to bring it in for the listeners is that there was a point in which you were going to become a part of the management in Lufthansa, which is the German airline for those people that don't know, right? So you've kind of taken a, a trajectory off course, right? I mean, because I imagine Lufthansa must have been one of the safest bets. If you were German, you went into the (laughs) 
management training scheme of Lufthansa. It was like you were made. You wouldn't lose your job, right? You would be there for, you know, the end of your days. And now you're if an I entrepreneur. Want, right. If I wanted to, yes. Right. And, and a lot, uh... I guess a lot of people <laughs> stayed the course, right? But where you are now, I know you're not into games per se, but you've had this sort of interesting trajectory. You know, if you looked back and if you had stayed out in Lufthansa, could you imagine, could you sort of picture that for us, what that would have been like compared to where you are now? Because you would have been in Germany. Now you're in Bangkok. Management trainee or management of Lufthansa. Now you're in Bangkok as an entrepreneur. Uh-huh. I'm just curious. I mean, did, did the people around you, I know you, you sort of, I mean, the people around you that you grew up with, did they sort of think you're crazy for choosing that path? Because I may think, why do you want to do that? Why do you want to risk everything? You could have this nice job. I think the people who I grew up around with uh, already considered me crazy before, so choosing well, that path probably was more in line with the image I already had. Not a big surprise for anybody. Um, I think, well, obviously, you know, if you have a corporate gig lined up and then you start to, you know, start your own business, um, you're not exactly going to uh, – the reaction from your parents is not going to be a surprise. Um, because they tend to be a bit more conservative and, you know, value what this is the safer path. I think that's a big thing. Like if you're younger, you just haven't seen all the things that can go wrong. So you kind of are a lot more uh, willing to take risks. And I think it's, it's one of the great what ifs. Uh, what if I had stayed on? And um, so what I see from other people who did stay on, they, you know, would be now in management roles at either Lufthansa, a competing airline, or um, I think car rental service. I think one guy is a vice director of one of the biggest car rental companies in Europe. Uh, the, the thing is, the funny thing is, I, about a year before I finished my training program at Lufthansa, I gave a talk at my old high school because Lufthansa asked me, you know, we're looking for recruits. Can you talk to them? Can you, you know, showcase all the career options that there are? And I did that. And I was very surprised how interesting people thought airlines were and everybody wanted to become a pilot. And I'm like, OK, I you know, never quite got that. But that's um, and I remember being asked, I think one of the teachers asked me, where do I want to be when I'm done with this uh, program? And I said, well, maybe in a few years from now, I could run the uh, Thailand office of Lufthansa. <laughs> because I always, had, uh, I always thought Asia was a very interesting place. And I enjoyed my job at Lufthansa. And I thought, okay, well, maybe I can be for Lufthansa in Asia. Uh, little did I know that I actually, that that would come about in some form, although very differently. So um, it's, it's, it's always very tempting to ask yourself, okay, what would have happened if? Yes. However, on the other hand, I think I, I'm very happy with the path I chose. And I, I kind of feel I was drawn to it in one way or another. Hmm. So um, well, that's what I, I'm curious about myself. And we've all, I mean, myself and Michael have gone through this journey. And I think you sort of, you know, we, we've, we've disconnected in a way from where we grew up and moved somewhere else because life was better or the opportunity was better there, right? And I know a lot of people know Germany through technology and industry. And things have changed recently. If you go to places like Berlin, there's a real startup vibe there. But I think right. Germany is very much like here in Japan, where there are so many big, successful companies. Like, you know, you've got a Sony or a Panasonic, these kind of companies that, you know, if you're a talented, ambitious, the path wasn't like it would be in the valley, right? Go out and do your own thing. It would be, you know, why the hell do you want to go and risk everything when you can go and work for Sony and just keep your head down for 20, 30 years, right? So you've kind of made a conscious decision to come to Asia to make that happen, right? You kind of, I know you had this sort of thing about doing it through the airlines, but it actually worked out a different way for you, right? And I'm just wondering if, you know, the people know that as an option you know, would people consider bangkok or thailand as an option to come to if they were an entrepreneur i know you know you can go to chiang mai and there's a whole bunch of digital nomads living up there and that's kind of like word of mouth is spreading right but still mm. it's not kind of like the default choice is it if you're ambitious and growing up in germany it's like yep i'm gonna go to asia and go to thailand and start my own thing right to be fair it happened in steps so we started our company first in germany 
And then it was just one step after another. I mean, if you compare Germany and Thailand, um, I've went back to Berlin a couple of times and just to see what the startup scene there is like and to get an idea, okay, who do you meet in a co-working space in Berlin versus who do you meet in a co-working space in Bangkok? And the interesting thing is there, a lot of the, well, freelance, location independent, working from home startup people in Berlin are consultants for big companies. So they're essentially kind of uh, outsourced employees. And because, as you say, there is so much, so many successful companies that have so good economies of scale that they really can pay excellent salaries to their specialists and provide a lot of safety, security, um, which is very important to a lot of Germans. It's uh, Germans love having a safe thing. And... Um, that's the uh, that's definitely a big difference that in Germany you don't have to do your own thing to be successful mm. and um, in Thailand you have to because there's very few companies who will you know really value you as a specialist because there's just so many like it it's just not quite there and the other thing is you have what you have for example in Silicon Valley is that entrepreneurship or startups are really really sexy. Um, that is starting to change a bit. Um, maybe it has changed more in Germany than in Thailand, but startups are just not as sexy here. They're not, you know, founders aren't rock stars or not just not to the degree you have in the U S and even if you look at all the startups that are happening in Thailand, and if you ask two, three questions, you'll find out, Oh, it's actually the daughter or son of an existing family enterprise that is kind of, trying out the same industry in a digital environment. So you might, maybe the family business is um, a car company and then the uh, young next generation does a trial project in doing an online site for that. And that is, that is kind of still a big source of entrepreneurs in Thailand is, well, the next generation of family companies going off and doing their own thing. Uh, whereas in the past, maybe they would have gone more a corporate path to collect some experience before coming back and managing the family business. Mm -hmm. Well, that exists. Exactly. I mean, that's the natural progression for those families, isn't it? But there's also, a, you know, an interesting wave of entrepreneurs coming through, whether like yourself coming from abroad or younger people who are coming through, like those high school kids that you talked about in Thailand, who, you know, given the right opportunities will be a next generation of entrepreneurs, right? I think you have that, though the, there's a few barriers there, uh, mostly language. Um, there's very few, I mean, that high school that had that contest, um, they charge, I think, about thirty to, I think, $40,000 a year in school fees. Um, that is school fees, not boarding or anything. Plus, I mean, very few people have access to that kind of education. And if you look at the government schools um, and the quality of education that is available to the majority of the population, um, they are not doing English language uh, business pitching contests at university using uh, PowerPoint. So I think the pool of um, um, internationally connected or aware entrepreneurs who um, is – well, who could, the startup scene could draw on is a lot smaller than the overall population would suggest. I mean, that'll change. So I assume, you know, over the years, you will see improvements in education and language barrier. Not just It's not just about being able to expand to other countries, but it's able to be influenced by other countries because you don't really have people here as much aware of what's happening outside because if you don't speak the language, you don't really hear about it as much. So, um, so I think that'll grow and, um, I could see in the future Thailand playing a role more in line with the actual population levels you have here. While right now, as you said, it's still a lot of foreign entrepreneurs coming in and leveraging things here or family, um, companies, um, expanding. Mm. Good. Very interesting. Carsten, thank you so much for coming Very. onto the show and sharing your insights with us really educational as well. If we want to find out more about you and or moving to Thailand, getting a foothold 
in Thailand, whether we're coming as an entrepreneur or just to check it out. Can you share with us some links to find out more about you for the listeners so they can take it forward from here? Sure. Um, I run a website that is called Thailand Starter Kit, uh, thailandstarterkit.com, where I share practical advice for people on how to set up shop in Thailand, how to move here, retire here. I also run a podcast that's called Brood in Bangkok, broodinbangkok.com, where I share the conversations and stories I hear from people who are already in Bangkok. Uh, I think I had the UK's youngest drug counselor, uh, international novelist, list, a former cabinet minister. So you get an idea of the people you meet here. And I think talking about Bangkok, that's actually one of the underreported benefits of the location. It's just a place where you meet people with interesting stories. Wow. That sounds it. That sort of sounds like the street level intel that we are looking for, where you can get those sort of real life stories about the people behind the ecosystem. What's the name of your podcast again? Just so people can get that, check it out. It's called Brood in Bangkok. Uh, it's on iTunes, Stitcher. Just Google it. <laughs> Fantastic. We'll put it all in the show notes. Carsten, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your journey with us. Inspirational. We'll put all the details in there if people want to find out more about you. But yes, let's keep in touch. Hopefully, we'll see you in Bangkok soon. I mean, Mike was just down the road from you, but I'll be in Bangkok at some point in September as well with the road show. So it'd be good to hook up and go and find out a little bit more about the street level of Bangkok and some of those stories as well. That's casting everybody. Details in the good show stuff. notes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.